Hello, everyone. Um, we welcome you to the brief interventions to mitigate suicide risk safety planning webinar. This is the second in a four part series on suicide prevention and primary care. Additional events that we will be having on October 24th are counseling on access to lethal means. On November 7th, caring contracts, contacts, patient education and other strategies. Please remember to stay muted unless you have a question. Then unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone on the left hand side of the corner of the page or type your question into chat. Our objectives for today are the efficacy of safety planning slash crisis response planning as a brief intervention. When, why, and how to conduct a safety planning intervention in primary care. Tips to increase the usefulness and efficacy of a safety plan for the patient. And finally, opportunities for more in-depth training in crisis response planning. Things to think about during the webinar are how can you or we use safety planning in our practice? And how can we increase the effectiveness of our safety planning interventions? I'd like to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Stephen Merrill, uh, primary care physician uh, at the Bountiful Clinic, right? Mm -hmm. Inner Mountain Medical Group, and Andrea Hood, MS Suicide Prevention Program Coordinator for the Zero Suicide Project at the Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Welcome. Thank you. So we will start with Andrea. All right. Okay, thank you for joining us today to talk about safety planning as a brief intervention. Um, I want to reorient us to the zero suicide quality improvement framework because safety planning is just one piece of comprehensive quality suicide care. And so these are the seven elements of zero suicide. Let me introduce these last time for you. Um, but you can learn more by visiting zerosuicide.sprc.org. So today we're going to be focused on these three elements in the model. Safety planning is a great tool to engage and empower patients. It's an effective suicide intervention and it's a great tool to use during transitions in care. So the purpose overall of safety planning is that we're trying to empower the patient to manage their suicidal thoughts and distress between episodes of care. So when do we use this intervention? The Suicide Prevention Resource Center recommends that we, do, we create a collaborative safety plan on the same day that the risk is identified and assessed. So let's look at some of the research for safety planning. Um, the science of suicide prevention is relatively new. Unfortunately, we now have great evidence for several interventions that significantly reduce suicide attempts. And safety planning and caring contacts are two of those brief interventions that we will be discussing on this webinar and in the one on November 7th. Um, the great thing about the two of them is that they have multiple clinical trials to support their efficacy and also their brief. So they can be done in your treatment setting in a variety of settings. And although they're brief, safety planning actually has measurable effects that last at least six months out. And that is very important to know um, and a very good reason for taking the time to do this intervention with your patient. So let's look at two specific research studies uh, that came out in the last two years around safety planning. So the first one was in 2017 um, and they compared, the comparison group was a contract for safety and the intervention group received a crisis response plan. And those receiving the crisis response plan had a 76% reduction in suicide attempts at six month follow up. Um, crisis response planning was also associated with a faster decline in suicide ideation and fewer inpatient hospitalization days. So we're, sh we're seeing that it really does reduce distress. Um, it reduces the need for inpatient treatment, saves money in that sense, and reduces suicide attempts. Okay, this next study was published in 2018. And this was really exciting because they had um, a large group of over 1600 patients included in the study and they used a comparison, a cohort comparison design at nine Veterans Health Administration hospitals. And so this included patients who had an ED visit for suicide related concern. 
the intervention group received the safety planning intervention and at least two telephone follow-up contacts. Um, and they had excellent results with 45% fewer suicide behaviors at six month follow-up. Um, and this might have been partially explained by the fact that they were also twice as likely to attend at least one outpatient mental health visit. And so safety planning also shows some promise in um, increasing engagement overall in care. So from this research, I really hope that you can have confidence that safety planning is effective in reducing distress and suicide attempts and that it is um, definitely worthwhile in taking the time to do this with a patient, that it can be very helpful to them. Okay, so we're, we're kind of switching, I think, a paradigm that we've had in healthcare for some time um, for, from a focus on coercion and treatment compliance to a focus on empowering the patient to self-manage their mental health and their thoughts of suicide. So rather than telling the person what not to do, which is act on their suicidal thoughts, a safety plan helps the person know what they can do to feel better and to stay safe in that moment of crisis. And this is really helpful because in a crisis, we often have it's almost like seeing in tunnel vision, right? Where it's very difficult to problem solve. You have very high emotional arousal and um, having this plan in place can give you concrete steps to do that don't require you to engage those higher level processing skills. And so it will help you return to that calmer baseline where more options are available and um, help a person get through that suicide crisis. So um, this is very different from what we used to use as a contract for safety or a no suicide contract. And the National Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has actually come out and directly stated that uh, no suicide contracts are not recommended and never sufficient. And so we're really moving away from those and towards this safety planning model as a best practice. So in this way, we're accomplishing the patient's goal to feel better and accomplishing our goal to keep them safe at the same time. And so that's, um, that's why it works so well um, because we're, we're also basing this on the patient's needs and wants. So how do you do this intervention well? And so we're going to turn that over to Dr. Mer Merrill and he'll introduce some tips and what he's found to be effective in his practice. So I'm very grateful to be here. I'm a family physician in the uh, Bountiful area. Um, and I work uh, with a lot of patients who deal with mental health. It probably represents almost 60% of what I do day to day. And I've taken care of patients who um, have had suicide attempts after my care, before my care, and everywhere in between. Um, the reason I'm here today is because there is some evidence to support safety plan creating. It has been shown now to decrease suicide behavior. And we crave in medicine as physicians, evidence to support what we do. Um, I think our training has primarily said, be sure to contract patients for safety. That's not really bearing out to be effective in studies to help prevent suicide. Um, what has been shown, recent studies are showing that if we sit down with patients and talk about a safety plan or a crisis response plan, it helps patients attempt suicide less. Um, so this is how I got interested in it. I attempted the most recent Zero Suicide Summit, which was this past summer of 2018, and received training in crisis response plans. Since that time, um, I've been implementing this over the past two months and have been very, very grateful for the training I received and for the discussions I'm having with my patients. I feel like I'm actually able to help my patient and, and not just say, you need to go to the ER because you're feeling suicidal and I'm sorry, we're gonna have to you know, rush you there by ambulance, but I'm able to sit down and talk to my patients about coping mechanisms. I can talk with them about the warning signs that they should be aware of. I can write down resources that they can have access to when they're needing to escalate their care. And probably most importantly, I talk to them about their reasons for living. So I'd like to go through the steps of a safety plan First, by identifying the warning signs with my patients. Um, I typically say, what are the thoughts that you're having when you know you're in a bad place? And they normally say something like, um, life isn't worth living, or I'm just a horrible person, or I'm the worst person ever. Um, they describe behaviors that they're cutting, or they are secluding themselves in their rooms. They describe um, physical symptoms of they always have a headache, or they feel nauseous, or uh, they're feeling profoundly fatigued and I actually have them sit down with a sheet of paper or with a note card and write that down and say, okay, warning signs, 
And as much as possible, I have the patient write it out because it's good for them to generate it. Again, not me telling them, but they're generating um, their care and they recognize what are the warning signs and then followed by the coping mechanisms in the past that have worked for them. Most often the first thing they'll say is, ah, nothing works. Um, it, it hasn't worked in the past and it, it, it won't work again. I oftentimes follow that up with, well, describe for me a really happy time in your life. When was, when was a good time in your life? And they'll describe oftentimes um, interactions with friends. They'll describe a relationship that's important to them, that is still meaningful to them. They'll describe a time when they were exercising more regularly. They'll describe activities that, that you, can, um, you can notate and then share with them in a reflective way. And then I have patients write down those coping mechanisms. When you're feeling bad, take those deep breaths, go for a walk. If you're in the office and you can't leave your desk, then reflect on that really good vacation that you had where you had a good moment with your spouse or with your children. And that is protective for our patients. Safety plans should also include a list of, of individuals that are important to, um, to our patients. Uh, I have them write down next to the names of those individuals, the contact information that they can use to call those people in case they don't have their cell phone, in case they, the cell phone is broken, in case they aren't where they normally are, they can pull out their safety plan. I, again, use note cards. They pull it out, they remember, they can call, they can reach individuals when they don't always have access to the technology that probably they still have a lot of access to technology. Um, one thing that has been very important is to list professional services on there as well. It's important that this is on the latter end of the safety plan because we want to empower patients to first go through their coping mechanisms, go through the resources that they have close to them because those are effective and they're very helpful for patients. They need to have the National Crisis Line on there. They need to know about the Safe UT app. Um, this lists number six, reasons for living. I oftentimes begin the conversation about suicide with their reasons for living, and I do it in the following way. When I have a patient that's cutting or I have a patient that's had a suicide attempt, I say, tell me what you were experiencing before you had that suicide attempt. Um, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? We write those warning signs down. And then I say, what got in the way? What was it that kept you from completing suicide? Was it an individual who intervened? Was it the thought that I can't do this because I don't want my children to experience the emotional damage from their father, their mother, their relative committing suicide? Was it just that it, it would be messy and I didn't like that idea or I wasn't ready for death? And we can then talk about and dive into the underlying reasons that keep people safe. And those are identified as reasons for living. It's important in the safety plan to list those um, and to help patients go back to them. The last component of a safety plan is a discussion about keeping their environment safe. We know that one individual and a second individual who have the same risk factors for committing suicide and feel the same urgency to commit suicide, one might be more likely if they have access to lethal means. Um, in the state of Utah, that a lot of that is firearms. It's not wrong to own a gun, but it's okay to talk about owning a gun and whether it's safe if you have a patient who's suicidal. I typically just say, do you own a gun? Do you have a safe? Is it locked up? Um, and if I'm working with somebody who's suicidal, I say, I would recommend that you have that gun, even if it's locked up and it's safe and they know where the ammunition is, have it be with your cousin or with your uncle or with somebody else while we're dealing with the person being acutely suicidal. Um, we'll go through a few slides that kind of uh, elaborate more on that. One of the other means that we need to talk about is also access to medications. Um, I'll actually go ahead and just flip to that and then come back to the previous slide. So what can we do if they need to continue taking medications, but those medicines have a risk of, uh, of overdosing on and having a suicide attempt? One thing I have done with my patients is I've reduced the number of prescriptions I'm giving them 
the number of days they're, they're able to access the, the medicine. So instead of a 90 day supply, we do a 30. Instead of a 30 day supply, you do a seven day supply with patients that you're worried about. Especially for my younger patients, I ask the family members to be the one controlling the medicines and dispensing the medicines so that the teenager doesn't have access to 30 plus, uh, you know, venlafaxin medicines that'll give them a seizure. Um, so these are some steps to help our patients become safer. The next webinar is going to be all about firearms and making the environment safer. So we, we really encourage folks to, um, to, to, tune in to the, to the next one. Um, I think it's somewhat self-explanatory that the ideal safety plan should be collaborative. Um, I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but when I sit down with my patients, I do my best to not do a lot of talking. It's okay for there to be some silence. It's okay for there to be some thinking on the patient's part for what are those reasons for living? What are things that have worked? And it's okay to push them on things when they say this hasn't worked at all to try and find the happiest time in their life and what represented that happiest time in their life. Um, any thoughts before we continue on this, Andrea? Well, I will say I get asked a lot about um, what to do when a patient denies having reasons for living. And so I, I really like your tip about asking them about happier times in their life and what were their reasons for living at that time. Um, but I also really liked Craig Bryan's tip that he, he shares in crisis response planning about um, patients who live with, you know, terminal illness or chronic pain. He sometimes uses a metaphor with them. He says, you know, just humor me for a moment and imagine that I had the ability, the, a magic wand or whatever, to take away that pain or that terminal illness or whatever, you know, loss or, or pain in your life is most distressing to you and prevents you from, from doing what you want to do. Um, what would a life worth living look like if I could take that away? And so they discuss what makes up a life worth living. And then after that conversation, he says, well, how could we implement, how could you have some of those things in your real life, you know, in within the circumstances that are actually present? So how could you have, you know, the connection to friends or the purpose in work or the, you know, whatever it is that actually makes your life meaningful and worth living to you? That's fantastic. And I will have patients write that down and say, okay, one of those that I've identified with some patients is to list the three things they're grateful for or to write down a goal that they're working towards. Normally when patients are super depressed, they're not thinking about way in the future, but if it's written down, when that frontal lobe shuts down because they're feeling suicidal, it gives them something to come back and look at and read and remind themselves of those times and those coping mechanisms and the things that can be protected for our patients. We'll briefly just finish out the, the last part of our, our slides, but then we really want to turn over some time to questions and do our absolute best to, to help to answer those. Um, so strategies for making an environment safe, involving the family members is critical. Um, and hopefully in the discussion of a safety plan, the individuals you're working with will identify those people that mean the most to them in their reasons for living, in the people that they turn to when they're having a hard time. And it's okay to include them in the next step to say, we need to keep you safe. Can mom, can dad, can brother, can somebody else hold on to the firearm or can they help dispense medications so that you're safe, at least for the season when you're feeling suicidal. Um, barriers, the one that I hear the most and the one that I've experienced the most as a family physician and as a, as a physician in general is time. Um, a patient comes in for a sinus infection and they do a PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 and they're feeling depressed and um, you have only X amount of time to sit down with them. My recommendation is to treat the suicidal patient as we do in medicine, the patient that has chest pain. If I have a 55 year old gentleman who is complaining about crushing chest pain, there isn't anything else I do, but sit down with them, get the full story. When do their symptoms start? What are all their medications? Do the EKG, connect them to the next level of care that they need, even if that takes 40 minutes, an hour. It's not convenient. It will never be convenient, but it's the care that they need. We need to start treating the suicidal patient as chest pain we do in our medicine. Um, so I try to do that. Um, what does that mean? It means I'm taking extra time with that patient, 
What are other barriers to that? Can I bill for that? Practically, that is a barrier. Yes, I, if I'm spending time coordinating care with that patient, counseling that patient, their reasons for living, I'm addressing their, their current needs, it's okay, in my opinion, to then say that's a 99214, that's a 99215, and to describe that in my billing. Um, there are other barriers as well. For myself, awareness of these evidence-based practices, I would highly encourage every family physician, every primary care physician, every ER physician who sees this and experiences this kind of care to attend the Zero Suicide Summit that's coming up this coming summer because we'll be able to practically talk about this and receive some training in, in safety plans and other things that have evidence to support them. So, Andrea, any other thoughts okay. before we turn it over to questions? Yes, just really quickly, I wanted to mention that safety planning is going to be most effective um, when they're used as the overall, um, part of the overall zero, zero suicide quality improvement framework. So that means um, that ideally we're gonna have a policy or protocol in place in every office to regularly screen patients for suicide risk, to do a same day collaborative safety plan, to continuously check in with the patient while their suicide risk is high, and to document that in the electronic health record. Um, and then once that protocol is in place, it's tempting to just assume that everyone in the office is following it perfectly, but it actually really helps and can be very beneficial to pull that data regularly and to see what percentage of patients are getting a safe, same day safety plan and what the quality is of those safety plans. Um, and this is really about having more than a one-time training. It's about a focus of improvement and a focus on quality suicide care. So we hope that you'll kind of adopt that mission and that goal with us and that we can um, work on that goal alongside you. So we wanted to ask you next, um, what one piece of information has most impacted you today or that you plan to use in your future practice? And please feel free to enter that now into the chat. And we would also love to hear any questions that you have at this time. Great, so Andrea and Dr. Merrill, as we're waiting for folks to respond in chat, there was a question um, from Allison Lewis, and I'll go ahead and pose it, but Allison, if you want to, in the meantime, unmute yourself to elaborate further, you're certainly welcome to do that. Allison's question is, we're starting to use safety planning in our practice, but the doctors are worried to sometimes address this as they're not mental health specialists. What are your thoughts? I can appreciate that completely. Um, it, it's a little, I feel self-conscious being up here as a family physician um, doing training on, on crisis response plans um, because I'm not a mental health specialist. I'm not a psychiatrist. That said, this is what I see day in and day out. And for your specific question, what about those caregivers who are not comfortable starting to do crisis response plans or safety plans? I would compare it again to a patient who comes in and they do a point of care A1C and it's 14. Um, they're, they're currently asymptomatic. They're not ready to act out you know, on a plan as the correlate to suicide. You would start them on something, even if eventually they need to be in the, in the hands of an endocrinologist. The same thing is true, I think, with suicide and crisis response plans. Do your best. Um, do your best. Sit down and start to have that conversation with the patient about what are the barriers to suicide? What have they done in the past that's been helpful? What are the steps they can take when they're feeling suicidal? And so I, I would say do your best. And for those interested, come and get additional training. Great, thank you. We had another question then from David asking about safety planning. Are there further guidelines for safety planning that can be found online or where can someone go to learn more or get training? Um, at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center site, they have another online 30 minute training on safety planning, but really the best quality training is going to be in person where you have a chance to practice and get feedback. And so we, um, several times throughout the year here at the Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, we sponsor those trainings and we also provide them as part of our Zero Suicide Summit. So I encourage you to email me and you can get on a wait list and be notified of the next available training opportunity. Great, and I went ahead, Andrea, and put your, your email um, address in the chat um, along with the, um, the websites that you mentioned that folks can go to. 
Uh, another question that came in from Hoyt asked about what screens are you, do you suggest or do you recommend using? Um, for myself as a primary care physician, I, I work within Intermountain, so the institution is backing PHQ-2s and PHQ-9s. I think it's important to state that not everybody who commits suicide, who dies by suicide, is feeling depressed beforehand. Um, so that screening tool will not catch everybody who will die by suicide within the next month. It is a screening tool, and it's, I usually start with that. Um, question nine on the PHQ-2, which most folks know, asks about their concerns for self-harm for, for suicide. Um, Columbia is another one that I use. Um, I have used, and it tries to gauge on the risk factors that the patient has, the likelihood of, of attempting suicide in the near future. Um, I will be honest, my time constraints typically say, leave me with the PHQ-2, PHQ-9 that somebody else has done, and then I just start with a safety plan. Because if the person is, has marked anything on that question nine, we need to talk about the reasons for living. And in that conversation, we talk about the risk factors that they have for suicide. We basically go through the elements of the Columbia and then we finish that conversation. And I, I feel like I've got a better idea having done the safety plan of how likely are they to complete, to, to try suicide and where do they need to go from there? And there are patients that I've sent from my office to go to the emergency department, you know, by ambulance, by private transport, if they've got family members nearby. And um, I, I feel like the safety plan itself oftentimes can elicit a lot of those risk factors. I think for mental health providers, you guys uh, do a lot more on the risk assessment, which I think is, is fantastic and wonderful. Um, the time constraints typically lead me to do, like I said, PHQ-9 and then jump into a safety plan. The good thing about, about jumping right into the safety plan and, um, and getting that started in a primary care setting, I think, is that it's available to that patient as they walk out the door. So if you're giving them a referral to a mental health specialist, that's great. But what if they can't get in to see that specialist exactly. until, you know, a week out or a few days, what is the patient supposed to do in the meantime? Exactly. And that's where a safety plan gives you confidence that they have a plan and some skills and some supports in place um, to manage those thoughts and manage that distress in the meantime. Yeah. And it can be really powerful for that purpose. And then the mental health specialist can take that safety plan and build on it and edit it and um, move forward from there. And I have, I have uh, three by five cards, index cards that I, I have a whole stack of them right in front of where all the other handouts and things are that we give to patients so that I can grab it, complete it, and they're walking out with something that'll help. So um, a follow-up question on that from Hoyt was just to sort of confirm. So a protocol might be to use the PHQ-2, which could be administered outside the office, followed if necessary by a screening version of the Columbia while developing the safety plan. Is that yes? You that, yes. That again, the only that is an appropriate way of going through it. Um, PHQ-2 asks mostly about depression. PHQ-9, uh, the ninth question asks specifically about suicide. Safety plans again has evidence to support that. The Columbia is oftentimes used and is kind of the standard for risk stratification. Um, my only hesitation with doing all of that is again time. Um, and if I'm worried about suicide, I will go to a safety plan, even if they answer the PHQ-2 normally. Um, that's, that's, uh, I'm seeing that at times as well. It's anxiety that the patient is feeling, not depression, mm -hmm. but they still feel suicidal. And unless they answer PHQ-2 towards depression, we miss that anxiety, we miss the suicidal behavior that the patient is having. Great, and then there were just a couple of questions, I'll just kind of roll into one that, that talks about, you know, implementing this in primary care is, is that you're feeling that safety planning is something that can be done even for practices, primary care practices that have not, say, embarked on, on behavioral health integration and have co-located co mental health specialists. Is this, is this something that you think is well within their capabilities? And I do, my, 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 my response to that is if we wait for the system to be perfectly in place, we'll be waiting a long time to address the concerns we have for our patients. And that is true for hepatitis C, for HIV. Um, that's true for every health outcome we deal with in primary care. And it's not that other groups aren't trying to work on this as well, but if we're trying to take the lead, if we deal with this every day, let's go ahead and learn how to do safety plans. And let's go ahead and start to implement them as soon as we can. 
I'm planning on attending the Zero Suicide Summit again because I want additional training on this. I want to be better. But I feel like having attended one of the crisis response training, I can at least get started, just like I would for a patient with the high A1C who I discover has hepatitis C or HIV who, who needs to begin some form of treatment. Um, I, I do my best to at least start that process if I'm not going to muddy the water. Obviously, hepatitis C, HIV treatment and things is it's not apples to apples exactly but I think I can at least begin a safety plan for a patient who is feeling suicidal. I think also if you're worried about liability concerns that safety planning is an evidence-based recommended intervention and considered a best practice and so you actually are protecting yourself by working with the patient to provide a safety plan. So it has a lot of benefits but you know that's one of them if that's something you're concerned about. Great. Well, thank you. Our time is up. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Merrill and Andrea Hood. We appreciate you coming and doing such a great webinar. That's awesome. And we will look forward to seeing everybody on October 24th for our next webinar. And we will send out the, um, the slides um, via email. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.